moving test. It's a wriggler, isn't it? That one. Yes. Oops. Oops. Nothing. Oh, you break! Don't break my baby. <laughs> Is the baby happy now? Baby's getting happier. Hey, the baby's sleek and you sleep again. It's gurgling. Very good. Oh. Very good. Let me cover her up. Thank you so Thank you. much. Hey. And now you know it's not only babies that cry. Some people cry by groaning and grumping. Some cry because they are sad and they're hurting. And you know what? Some just cry because they're looking for attention. So uh, we are going to th uh, think about the Israelites years ago. Do you know why they were crying? Because they were, uh, they were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. And can you imagine how Pharaoh actually, what he did to them? He wasn't very kind to them, was he? Hey. But you know, God, as a loving father, just as parents care for their babies, God was caring for them too. And he looked out to see what was happening. And he actually went to speak to Moses. And he said to Moses, um, I have seen... Uh, I have seen the afflictions of my people, and I know their suffering, and I have come down to come and deliver them. So, you know, do you think that he kept this promise? God did come down, and he did deliver them. He delivered them through the Red Sea. He saved them over there. And we too, that same God that came to speak to Moses, God speaks to us too when we cry to him. So um, when we cry to him, God said to us, come, all, uh, come to me all you are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me. So what I'm going to say now is uh, God is near. We, we need not fear. We need not fear. Let's try that again. God is near. We need not fear. Okay, a last time. God is near. We need not fear. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Anna, and I'm married to Albert. And these are our two daughters. <coughs> now, under your tree, you will find a template of a family tree. It looks like this. Under your chairs. You may either choose to fill it in now as a family or you can do it afterwards. We found it very interesting to do it together as a family. Now, Albert and, and I, we are from the Asahai and Domoroira families as a family tree. Now, family tree conversations can be very interesting. I can recall tell you when we first met years back when we discovered that we are both from Uppington. What interesting conversation that was. We talked about where we grew up which schools you attend. So that can be very interesting, actually. <coughs> Those things make you feel like you share something, you have something in common. Now, as we have something in common from where we, you attend school or where you went to, you grew up in a neighborhood, that is significant. But what is more significant is the, the identity we have as Christians in the St. James family. And Albert is going to talk to you about our identity in Christ as a family. Right. So for the Israelites, the knowledge of where they come from was profound and it was significant. 
and it influenced their very identity in a similar way that our upbringing can influence our identity and where we come from. Their great, 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 great grandfather was Abraham. And God made certain promises to Abraham, and they knew that. And we see these promises throughout Genesis. You start Genesis chapter 12, as God calls Abraham, and throughout Genesis you see those, those promises that God makes to Abraham. Now then we get to Moses and the burning bush, and as God is talking to Moses, he says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And being the children of Abraham meant that they, that they were recipients of those promises that was made to Abraham. Now the Bible teaches in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, that in Christ, Christians are sons of God through faith. We are part of Abraham's family, heirs according to promise. And it's a wonderful chapter, so do go read it because it makes the fantastic link between Christians uh, uh, um, and how, how we should understand us being children of, of Abraham as well. Now how do you respond then to such marvelous truth? Moses fell on his face. Many others did similar. And I think throughout, throughout the Christian history, people have responded by worshipping God. Right? Just like the Israelites were called to worship God and celebrate His goodness to us, we see in Psalm 95 verses 1 to 2, I want to read it to us. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So we acknowledge and we worship him. And the words will also come up, come up on the screen. So I will say, God is over all, and the people of God say, Under nothing. Let's go again. God is over all, Under nothing. And with that, I think we're going to have a couple of songs to sing. vaccination commercial I am simply not qualified to advise you even though I have had mine Johnson and Johnson now <laughs> let's think a moment about how vaccines work well traditional vaccines anyway 
Now, what they do is this. They get a weakened dose of the virus, whatever that virus might be, whether it's TB or polio or something like that, or, and, well, they mix it with some other chemicals, and then they jab it in your arm. And somehow or other, your body learns to fight and to defeat that virus. It's called the vaccine principle. The thing that harms you is the same thing that the scientists use to help you. Now, the vaccine principle helps us to understand what went on with the blood that the Israelites had to paint on their do doorposts at Passover, which saved them from the last and most severe of the ten plagues, the angel of death that God sent on the wicked and evil people of Israel and their Pharaoh. You see, the God who sent the plague is the same God who saved his people, but not the Egyptians, from it. Now, let's fast forward a few thousand years, and the Passover can help us understand the gospel more clearly. You see, the Bible tells us that Jesus is now the sacrificial, blood-shedding Lamb of God, who, according to John the Baptist, takes away the sins of the world. You see, it's all about the cross of Christ. So, let's reapply that vaccine principle to the gospel. The God who hated our sin is the same God who helped us to overcome it. The God who hated our sin is the same God who helped us overcome it through the blood of Jesus spilled for each one of us on the cross. You see, God, God's Son, saves those who trust in him from God's wrath and anger. So, never mind COVID injections right now. Have you had your gospel vaccination? It's full of surprises down here. I've got something else for you. Now, if you are below, I don't know, 20 maybe, you probably haven't seen one of these. Well, if you have seen it, you almost certainly haven't used it. <laughs> it's a brick, I'm telling you. Okay. What is it? Yeah. What is it? It's a phone. It's a funny looking phone, isn't it? Where, where are the buttons? Where's the screen? Oh, wiggly, wiggly, wiggly. My poor old dad, I remember when I was growing up, he's got those, like those big fat sausage fingers. Anybody, any man, maybe he got big fat sausage fingers? Yeah, and he used to get his fingers stuck in there, can't get them out. Okay, and it took like half an hour to dial a phone number. That's why he never calls. <laughs> well, I think that's the reason. So, yeah, so here we have, okay, a telephone. And what does it do? Call people. You can speak to people on it. It's a wonderful invention. Every home should have one. <laughs> now, contrast it. Ooh. Nearly forgot. Fell out of my pocket. Contrast it with one of these. What's this? It's a smartphone. It's because it's very clever. Do you want to know how clever my smartphone is? It's even cleverer than Cornell and Dennis and Kayla and anybody else who I can pick on. It's fantastically clever, okay? What does it do? It takes photos. It can give me directions. 
I thought that was my wife's job, but um, hey. Uh, anything else, what else can it do? It has Google! It has Google! Who loves Google? I'm a duck duck go man myself. What else does it do? It's, you can actually speak on it as well. You can actually still speak to people. You can send social media messages. You can do all kinds of things. It makes calls and, 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 and. There seems to be no limit. So a smartphone is the same but different. Okay? It's the same but different. Now, there was a guy called Steve Jobs. He's dead now. Okay, but back in, oh, I suppose that's one thing a smartphone couldn't do. Okay, all right, keep you alive. Okay, so back in 2007, okay, he and his company called Apple invented the first ever smartphone, the iPhone. Who's got an iPhone? They all, you, can, you can just tell the people have got iPhones because they look down their nose at you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, well, so Steve Jobs, okay, he redefined the phone, okay? No longer could you just speak to people. You could and, 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 and forever do other things on it as well. Now, let's think for a minute how Jesus redefined the Passover, okay? During the Last Supper, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, didn't he? And he said, basically, I'm putting words in his mouth, but he said, this is no longer here to represent the rush from Egypt, okay, because they didn't have time to bake bread with yeast in it that would rise. He said, this bread here now represents my body, which will be broken for you. And with the wine, as they sat there drinking, he said, this wine here no longer represents the lamb's blood painted over the doorposts. It's now a symbol of my blood shed for you on that old rugged cross. You see, when you and I become a Christian, our life also stays the same but is different, isn't it? Because the gospel transforms our lives and our futures. So, if you call yourself a Christian here today, ask yourself this question, or well, two questions actually. What has stayed the same since you became a Christian? But well, what is also now different. Think about it. Mm, you smell that. <laughs> Wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> Don't know about you. But um, when I smell filtered coffee, it always takes me back to growing up on, in Cape Town on the slopes of Table Mountain. We had some German neighbours, and whenever we went there, there was filtered coffee smell. And it brings back memories of apple tart and Christmas time with all the little German neighbours and fresh cream and things like that. Um, what about when you go and visit your granny? That smell of cookies or rusks baking. Smells bring back memories for us. What about going to the spur? You know that specific spur smell? And the smell of a braai or maybe a lamb roasting. Well, for the Israelites it would have been the same. That smell that you get when you smell lamb cooking 
would have taken them back to when they escaped from Egypt, that Passover lamb. Um, and when Jesus celebrated the Last Supper, they would have also had that smell of the lamb cooking. And it would have been a reminder of um, the Lord's deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt. Um, but at the Last Supper, that was the time when Jesus changed things. And that um, his blood now rep is represented by the wine. And his body broken is represented by the blood. And now Jacques is supposed to appear here. <laughs> We are going to um, take communion together this morning. And it's one of the reasons why we are here. And it's so good. It is so, so good. Don't you think it's so good to see all of you here this morning? Um, we've been going through Sundays, a little bit here, a little bit there. But it's so good to have all of us present here, or many of us present here this morning, to, for this occasion, to take communion together. And when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, as we know it, the communion, he said that whenever you do this, you should do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said that. Therefore, as we come uh, to our time of communion, we are mindful of his life that was given for us on the cross. This supper means communion. The, it's communion with Christ, but it's also communion with one another. The word communion breaks up in two. Um, union and then the prefix or what goes before it. Com, which basically means union with. And so we invite everyone who has, who knows that they have union with Christ and union with the body of Christ, the church. We invite each one of you to share in a communion with us this morning. It's almost like um, I lost my Play-Doh. But if you take two colors of Play-Doh, help me think here quickly. If I have red and if I have yellow Play-Doh, and I don't think about mixing it becomes a different color, but it's Play-Doh. So what happens if I mix the two Play-Dohs together? What happens? You get orange. See, now, now you're thinking about two colors, eh? Mixing it, you get a different color. But if I'm Play-Doh, if I take Play-Doh and I mix it together, you still have the two colors, but they are one thing. They are in union with one another. And that's the same with us in Jesus Christ. When we have placed our faith in Him, we become one with Him and He with us. He in us and we in Him. I don't become Jesus and Jesus don't become me, but we are one. We are in union with one another. And everyone who has that union with Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, we invite you to share in a communion with us this morning. If you are not sure, if you are not sure about where you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to implore you, I want to encourage you to make use of this time to think about that, prayerfully consider where you are in relation to Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us and then uh, we're going to take communion together. Let's, let's pray this prayer. Please bow with me. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness. Instead, we trust in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table, but your mercy is everlasting. Grant, therefore, that we may by faith eat the flesh and drink the blood of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, to be united to Him and He to us. As we approach the Lord's table, hear are these words of encouragement. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and lonely of heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven 
given among men by which we must be saved. Amen. I think so. <laughs> All right. Well, today um, we've learned a couple of things. So there's a slide behind me with all the little pictures that we've, that we've gone through. And what we've learned today was that God hears our cries in our hours of need, as he did with Moses and the people of Israel in their cry of need when they were struggling in Egypt, burdened under the slavery under Pharaoh. The burning bush reminded us of how holy God is and how sinful we are and how much in need of His forgiveness we are in order to be clean. And then we reflected on a Passover meal eaten by the Israelites the night before that they escaped from Egypt. We learned how much God hated our sin, but how much He wanted to help us and how much He helped us to overcome our sin by making His one and only Son to be a sacrificial lamb for us. That is amazing grace. The lamb who takes away the sins of the world, who takes away your sin. Finally, we joined in with Jesus and the disciples around the communion table. They celebrated the Lord's Supper. We celebrated on a recurring basis, reminding ourselves of the union we have in Jesus and with one another and what He has accomplished for us. That is a privilege, a tremendous privilege. And I pray that each one of you will realize how privileged you are if you can take that. And those of you who can't, I pray that you would seriously consider your stance before Him and your need of Jesus Christ. This is the message that we spread. Salvation through Jesus Christ. This is the message of the Passover. It's the gospel message. So therefore, we conclude by saying this together. I'll say the first part, and you say the last part with me. Go spread the word. Let God be heard. Thank you. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this tremendous time we could spend together as your people around this table, remembering the table that Jesus Christ sat with his disciples and looking ahead at the table to come where Jesus said, I will drink and eat of this when I see you again. We look forward to that day when we can have communion with you face to face, Jesus. Our Lord, our Savior, our King, in whose name alone we give you thanks. Amen. You will see underneath your chairs, there's a table talk, piece of paper. All right. uh, in our Sunday schools, you've become accustomed to this, that uh, the lesson that's there. This is here to assist you to go through this lesson again, to assist you as families to converse and discuss this with one another, with your family members. So take this home with you and make time for one another. Uh, maybe over lunch, maybe after a nice snooze this afternoon, or maybe during supper time, and just go through this again and a chat with one another about what happened here today, what you've learned, and what God's Word, what God has been saying to you.